The sky, majestic, vast, and ever-changing, but not as crowded as some would have us believe. To be sure, there are airplanes here. The United States has some of the most crowded airspace in the world. But if all of the 250,000 airplanes in the country were aloft at the same time, at the same altitude over the state of Texas, each would have more than a square mile of airspace all its own. So it's not surprising that aerial collisions are rare, but when they do occur, they're usually disastrous and always bad for aviation. That's why every pilot needs to know and practice the art of collision avoidance. See and avoid. That's what the experts say is the key to collision avoidance. See and avoid. It sounds easy, but it can be a challenge. Weather conditions, the airplane, even our own physical state can all compromise our ability to spot other aircraft. So how do you turn looking into seeing? Well, you can get help looking for traffic from people on the ground or from people inside the airplane. Hi, I'm Storm Field and we're here at Essex County Airport in Caldwell, New Jersey. It's a pretty busy airport, so I know how crowded the skies can be. General aviation has made impressive strides in safety in recent years, but reducing the number of collisions remains frustratingly elusive. There's a lot you and I as pilots can do to reduce the risk of collision, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Collisions have figured prominently in aviation history. Aviation's worst accidents have resulted from collisions on the ground and in the air. The air traffic control system can trace its roots to such an accident. In 1956, a DC-7 and Lockheed Constellation collided over the Grand Canyon. The calls for greater air safety that followed the accident led to the establishment of what is now the modern air traffic control system. The probable cause of that accident, as determined by the NTSB, the pilots did not see each other in time to avoid the collision. The NTSB cited possible contributing factors, including visual limitations of the cockpit, preoccupation with normal cockpit duties, attention on non-piloting related activities, and physiological limits to human vision. These same factors are behind almost every collision today. Thanks in part to airspace regulation and collision avoidance technology, collisions involving air carrier aircraft are extremely rare. Unfortunately, ground collisions have occurred with substantial loss of life, and collisions involving general aviation aircraft, though infrequent, may be catastrophic when they occur. If a general aviation aircraft were involved in a collision with an air carrier, it could create tremendous pressure for regulations that could restrict access and increase costs regardless of what the circumstances were or who was at fault. So all general aviation pilots have an extra responsibility to avoid collisions. The rules for aerial collision avoidance in VFR weather are spelled out in FAR 9167. When weather conditions permit, regardless of whether an operation is conducted under instrument flight rules or visual flight rules, Vigilance shall be maintained by each person operating an aircraft so as to see and avoid other aircraft. See and avoid. But how do you make sure you accomplish this task? Pilots have several tools. The most important is vision, knowing what to look for and how to look for it. Understanding the limitations of human vision is also critical. Knowledge of collision avoidance strategies and tactics is also important and knowing where and when collisions are most likely to occur can help you to stay alert in high-risk situations. Most mid-air collisions occur in daylight and in VFR conditions, the times of best visibility. They can also be correlated to traffic levels, most occurring between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. on weekends during the warmer months. In other words, times when the most traffic is in the air. Most occur within five miles of a non-towered airport, they are rarely head-on, instead typically involving two aircraft going in the same general direction. The closing speed at which they collide is usually relatively slow. 
Most involve a faster aircraft overtaking and hitting a slower moving airplane. And in more than a third of collisions, a flight instructor was aboard one of the aircraft. Instructors spend lots of time operating near airports, the most hazardous environment for collisions, and their attention is often diverted. If they're conducting instrument flight training, the student may be wearing a hood or foggles, resulting in one less pair of eyes for scanning and possibly restricting the instructor's view. But what does a potential threat look like? And how do you increase your chances of seeing it? You wouldn't fly an airplane before you knew how to use the instruments. The same principle applies to using your primary see and avoid instruments, your eyes. 80% of the information we absorb in everyday life is obtained through our eyes. But using this input to see and avoid other aircraft, that is to develop a good scanning technique, requires knowing how vision works and understanding its limitations. Light entering the eye falls on the retina, which is like the film in a camera. But unlike film, only one part of the retina, the fovea, actually sees the sharpest image. The fovea is really only a very small part of the retina, comprising just one degree of horizontal and vertical vision. Now, to give you an example of just how small this is, this area of best visual acuity is only the size of a quarter when you use one eye and look only four and a half feet away. Anything outside this area cannot be seen in detail. In fact, the area just 10 degrees outside of your foveal vision is only 10% as clear as that of your central field of vision. At a distance of 5,000 feet, the foveal field is roughly a 500-foot square, and you should easily be able to see traffic within that square. But if the same traffic is just outside your foveal field, you won't be able to see it until it's 500 feet away. Focus is essential to vision. In order to spot an aircraft at a distance, the eyes have to be focused for distant vision. But there's a problem. Unless your eyes have something distant to focus on, they will relax to an intermediate focal point, somewhere just a little in front of the propeller. Without something to look at, the eyes lose focus in anywhere from 60 to 80 seconds. This is called empty field myopia, and it can render everything outside the aircraft, including conflicting traffic, virtually invisible. To counteract this tendency, you need to periodically focus on the furthest point within sight, a cloud on the horizon, or a distant point on the ground. This refocusing needs to be part of a pilot scan technique. However, in times of poor visibility, in haze, over water, or with an obscured horizon, when a scan needs to be the sharpest, there could be nothing to focus on. In such conditions, the problem can be overcome by focusing on the farthest point visible. The wingtip will do. In times of poor visibility, this form of refocusing should be repeated every minute or so as part of your scan. The eye itself can have its capabilities reduced by environmental and physical factors. Irritants in the air, fatigue, age, residual alcohol in the bloodstream, lower oxygen levels all can impact the eye. Your aircraft can also contribute to reduced visibility. A dirty windshield, windshield distortion, glare, and aircraft design also affect what you see and how you see it. High wing and low wing aircraft, for example, each have blind spots pilots need to be aware of. High glare shields and window frame posts can also reduce visibility. Our dependence on binocular vision can also create blind spots in the visual field. The brain requires input from both eyes to accurately interpret the visual cues it receives. If the vision of one eye is blocked by a windshield post or other obstruction, the brain may not be able to see it, even if the other eye does. The NTSB has concluded this could be a causal factor in some in-flight collisions. Our eyes can also play tricks on us. We all know the power of optical illusions. These illusions can affect what we see in flight. For example, an aircraft at a slightly lower altitude coming toward you may look like it's above you and appear to descend as it comes closer. Night brings its own challenges for vision, but fortunately spotting aircraft isn't one of them. Less than 2% of GA collisions occur at night. However, the potential for ground collisions increases. 
Mid-air collisions can and do happen in any phase of flight. Knowing which phases represent the greatest risk and the see and avoid strategies appropriate for each can help you avoid the most common threats and deploy your resources when and how they're needed most. Cruise the en route portion of the flight with altitude, power settings, and heading established accounts for more than 20% of mid-air collisions. According to the NTSB, one common thread links the majority of these accidents inattention on the part of the pilots of both aircraft. In almost all cases, both pilots were in a position to see the other aircraft in enough time to take evasive action. Action on the part of either of the crews would have avoided the collision. When I flew over your house the other day, I used it as a, uh, a user waypoint. We can go direct there now. Level maintained 2,500. Intercept the 084 radial off Sparta track outbound to Breezy Intersection. Well, we're only 0.3 miles from your house, but this sun is really strong. Oh, but this is a, this is a good altitude. Oh, look, there's my wife. Where? Down there, down there. Hi. How far off of Sparta is Breezy? Uh, Sparta off of Breezy looks like 19 miles. About 19 miles, okay. Let me know if you see any traffic. All right. So we're going to maintain this uh, 110 heading until we intercept the 084 degree radial from Sparta. Okay. Head out to Breezy Intersection was about 19 miles. Circle around a little further. That would give me a, a better angle. Okay, hold on a moment. We're going to intercept the 084. Go to Breezy. I'm going to have you hold over Breezy. And once you intercept the 084, I'm going to put you under the partial panel. We'll uh, get rid of the AI, and uh, we'll have you do that just um, with the rest of the five instruments. Okay. All right. Okay. So right now I'm going to get out the blinders so I can uh, so I can put them on there when we get to the radial. And uh, oh, okay. Oh, right. I got the plane. Whoa! What was that? That was an airplane. Almost had a near miss. Woo! I near hit. How do you spot conflicting traffic? with a proper scan. A proper scan is actually a sequence of intense fixed observations. There is no one size fits all technique, but many pilots use some form of a block system scan, so-called because it divides the sky ahead into blocks, each spanning 10 to 15 degrees of the horizon. All the space visible from the cockpit comprises nine to 12 blocks or scan areas. The block scan is based on imagining a point in space at the center of each block. Focusing on each point allows the eye to detect contrasting or moving objects in the peripheral area between them. One common block scan technique is the side-to-side -side scan, starting on one side of the aircraft, sweep to the other side, block by block. Another popular technique is the front-to-side scan. Start with the block straight ahead, scan the blocks to one side of the aircraft, return to the center, and repeat the process to the other side. Any technique used must incorporate periods of fixed focus. Remember, your eyes need one to two seconds for accommodation before they can focus. A continuous sweep blurs the vision and will not identify targets in a timely manner. It's important to scan vertically as well as horizontally. The area 10 degrees above and below your flight path contains most of the potentially conflicting traffic. Unless they're climbing or descending rapidly, any aircraft outside that range can be discounted as a threat. Now, how far do you need to look? A scan covering 60 degrees on either side of the nose can detect the great majority of collision threats, but check further back every few scans. As we'll discuss in a moment, you can fine-tune the scan area for cruise flight even further. Something else to be aware of. Motion is invaluable to drawing the eye's attention. Yet an aircraft that is on a collision course with your aircraft will appear virtually motionless. It will remain a small speck until it is at a distance at which it may be too close to react to, when it suddenly appears to grow much larger, a phenomenon called the blossom effect. Efficient scanning requires efficient management of other cockpit duties. A good panel scan is one of the most important. The more quickly instruments and gauges can be monitored, the more time for looking outside the cockpit. 
An experimental scan training course conducted with military pilots found the average time needed to conduct the operations essential to flying the airplane was 20 seconds, 17 seconds for the outside scan, and 3 seconds for the panel scan. Without the benefit of intensive training, most pilots will need more time than this, but considerably more time should be spent on the external scan than the panel scan. And beware of distractions. Managing navigation equipment, copying ATC instructions, referencing charts and checklists, and tending to passengers can all interfere with effective scanning. The best pilots divide complex cockpit tasks into chunks of manageable time. It may take a minute to enter a new waypoint in the GPS, but in that time, they've also scanned the panel twice, scanned for traffic twice, and changed communication frequencies. An autopilot can make a big difference. It's a good idea to use it when workload is high. That way, you can spend more time looking for traffic. Be aware of the effect of weather conditions on visibility and collision avoidance as well. The rules of weather minimums for VFR flight were created with collision avoidance in mind. Three miles of visibility in haze may be perfectly legal and even perfectly safe in a Piper Cub flying at 60 miles per hour but two high-performance GA aircraft can approach each other at five miles per minute. That's only 36 seconds at a distance of three miles and only 12 seconds from collision at a distance of one mile. Hardly enough time to react to the aircraft when and if you finally see it. The sun's position can also affect visibility. If you're flying into the sun in the early morning or late afternoon, your forward visibility will be severely compromised. Try to avoid such flight conditions. In cruise flight, knowing where to look for traffic can be as important as how to look for it. That starts with using proper cruising altitudes. For flights at 3,000 feet AGL and above, odd thousands plus 500 on courses of 0 degrees through 179 degrees. For courses of 180 degrees through 359 degrees, even thousands plus 500. Cruising VFR on top, it's what memorable flights are made of. But here, too, there is collision potential. It's imperative to take cloud clearance requirements seriously, because fast-moving aircraft can pop out at any moment. In addition, ASF recommends that you coordinate with ATC for flights on top, either IFR or VFR flight following. That way you'll know about other coordinated traffic in the vicinity. As you might expect, you're more likely to encounter traffic near VORs and airports. And remember, whether you're on an IFR or VFR flight plan, see and avoid is the primary means of collision avoidance when you're not in the clouds. Does this mean you can ignore other areas? No. Planes descend and climb, and not all fly according to regs. So the potential for threats outside of the expected areas can't be ignored. However, managing your scan based on most likely threats makes good sense. Get help from all the eyes you can. This includes passengers and eyes on the ground. Flight following can be a valuable collision avoidance tool. Once identified on radar, air traffic controllers can advise you of the range, bearing, and altitude of conflicting traffic. But flight following is a supplement. Even when in radar contact, services are provided on a time-permitting basis, and it remains the pilot's responsibility to see and avoid other aircraft. And in busy traffic areas, with controllers staring at a scope full of ants on their radar screens, they may not be able to provide any advisories. Remember, if an aircraft doesn't have a transponder or doesn't have it turned on, it paints a much weaker image on the radar screen and may be difficult for the controller to see and to issue advisories about. This may have been a contributing factor in a recent mid-air collision involving a Cessna 172 and a business jet inside the Mode C Vale below Atlanta's Class Bravo airspace. The transponder in the 172, whose pilot was in the process of establishing contact with the approach facility, was found in the off position. The controller didn't issue a traffic advisory to the jet. 
FAR Part 91 requires all operable transponders to be turned on and squawking Mode C while in flight. If you want to make the best use of advisories, take a tour of an ATC facility and see how controllers operate. It can be a real eye-opener in helping you to understand what controllers can and can't do to help VFR traffic. Collisions during maneuvering account for almost 20% of mid-airs. They can occur in the pattern or away from an airport. Two aircraft engaged in formation flying, especially when the pilots have little or no formation flying experience, or aircraft engaged in air-to-air -air photography commonly figure in accident reports. Military pilots take pride in their formation flying skills. Formation is introduced in the first months of flight training and continues throughout their careers. Civil pilots also enjoy formation flying, but often their training is much less than for military pilots. Formation flying can be done safely, but it does present obvious collision potential. In fact, 20% of the mid-air collisions in one year took place during formation flight. This is why it's essential to get quality training in the fundamentals, practice to maintain proficiency, and never fly formation with a pilot you don't know. And while we're on the subject of military flying, how about the military's training for collision avoidance? One would think that fighter pilots especially receive special airplane spotting training. Actually, military pilots get the same training available at any good civilian flight school. But there are some important differences. Military pilots train in airplanes with superb visibility. Modern fighter planes have canopies that afford a 360 degree view of the sky and military pilots are selected from candidates with excellent vision. They also have tactical coordination help in spotting airplanes. Radar controllers on the ground and in the air classify targets and vector interceptors to them. Finally, onboard radar designed to detect aircraft is available and targets are displayed on a heads-up display in the cockpit. Center, Skyhawk 3844 Hotel, is the Pamlico MOA hot today? Center 3844 Hotel, Pamlico is hot, 11000. Roger, Center, MOA is hot. What do you say we head to the north instead? We'll divert and get away from this faster moving traffic. Pilots may not fly in active restricted areas without clearance, and they should plan to avoid military operations areas if the visibility is less than unlimited. Military pilots concentrating on their training mission may not see you until it's too late. The majority of mid-air collisions occur within five miles of an airport, and most of these collisions occur in the approach and landing phase, usually at a non-towered airport. Operating in and out of non-towered airports requires special diligence because no one is sequencing the planes in the pattern or calling traffic for landing aircraft. Pilots have to do that for themselves. Traffic, Archer 8121 Kilo is 10 northeast. What one ring are you favoring? Oh, Pete, I don't hear anything. Call in again. Favorite traffic, Archer 8121 Kilo is 10 northeast. What are the ones favoring today? Huh. Well, maybe they're in having a cup of coffee. Yeah, <laughs> maybe they're taking a nap. Probably. Favorite Unicom, Archer, 8121 Kilo, 9.5 miles northeast. What's, what runway are you favoring? Favorite traffic, Aronka 36973 is 7 south, 2500. Arrow 82 Hotel, turning base, Bay Bridge. Bay Bridge traffic, Seminole 347 is 4 to the east, descending at a 3.2. The Bay Bridge, Bay Bridge. Uh, Mooney is clear of uh, runway 11 at Bay Bridge. Uh, be advised, there's a cub on final at Bay Bridge with no radio. Boy, there sure is a lot of traffic around here. Well, maybe the restaurant's as good as they say it is. I hope they're not all going for the restaurant. No, as long as they save a piece of that blueberry pie for me, I'll be all right. I think you've had enough blueberry pie. Airport should be dead ahead. Raybridge Unicom, Archer 8121 Kilo, 6 Northeast. What runway are you using today? I can't believe no one's flying. Maybe they all flew somewhere else. The airport should be somewhere under 12 o'clock. Raybridge 
Tom Archer, 4 Echo Charlie at midfield, left downwind, runway 11 at Bay Bridge. Bay Bridge traffic, a rocket 36973 is 3 miles inbound, 2,500. We don't want to get mixed up in all these departures down here. Yeah, yeah, we'd better... Hey, there's the airport down there. I guess we weren't three miles out. Well, let's just enter a left downwind from here. Guess so. It's a non-towered airport. Bay Bridge traffic, Araka 36973 is left downwind for 11 Bay Bridge. Well, Pete, you know, this is a pretty busy airport. I'm really kind of surprised we haven't heard anyone on the frequency. Well, if there's no one in the pattern, then why don't we just go straight in? Uh, let's see what happens when we get closer to the airport. Oh, hey, look, there's a plane. Oh, there's another one. Hey, Pete, what frequency do you have dialed in there? Uh, 122.80. Oh, it's 123.0. Piper 73 Alpha, downwind, turn and base 11 Bay Bridge. Hey, there's the Piper! Uh, okay, Piper, uh, Piper at Bay Bridge, uh, this is Archer 8121 Kilo. We've got you in sight, uh, but it looks like there's no problem. Roger, Archer, we don't have you in sight. Uh, Bay Bridge traffic, Aronka 36973 is final 11 Bay Bridge. Final? He hasn't even turned base yet! Look out! Whoa! That was close. Have radio frequencies ready well before you get near the airport traffic area and check to make sure you have the right ones. If you're working approach control while inbound to a non-towered airport, tune in the Unicom frequency on your second radio and monitor it while inbound. Even though you may be shooting an instrument approach in IMC, there may be VFR traffic at the airport. So be sure to announce your presence and intentions on the common traffic advisory frequency. That way the VFR traffic will know you're coming. Mortonsville traffic, Mooney is a half mile final on the ILS for runway 23, full stop Mortonsville. Many professional flight crews adhere to sterile cockpit procedures while approaching or departing an airport. This means that only flight related conversation is permitted. It's a good idea for GA pilots too. Make sure your passengers know to refrain from any pilot distraction during these critical phases of flight. And when you communicate, keep transmissions relevant and succinct. Don't add to frequency congestion. Instead of saying, what runway are you favoring? Or, which runway are you landing? The proper request is, airport advisory, for anyone traffic, 46 Charlie's on the 45 for down. Often you can learn all you have to know by listening on the traffic advisory frequency. This saves valuable air time for a position reporting later. If you monitor the CTAF for 5 to 10 minutes and think like a controller, you'll have a good idea of the traffic situation at the field when you arrive. And if you can't get all the information you need, by all means ask, but keep transmissions succinct. State the name of the airport at the beginning and end of each transmission, so everyone on the frequency knows where you are. Don't use a full call sign unless you hear somebody else on the frequency with a similar one. Identifying your aircraft type is more useful anyway. You can announce yourself as Warrior, Skyhawk, or Bonanza as the case may be, so other aircraft in the pattern know what to look for. It's especially useful to know if you're looking for a high wing or a low wing plane. Make accurate position reports. Calling pattern turns gives a conspicuous change in direction and predictable location that makes it easier for other aircraft to see you. Downwind, turning base, and base to final. If inbound on an instrument approach, report the distance from the airport rather than approach fix your passing. That makes your location easier for everyone to know. And maintain vigilance. Your ears can help by listening to radio traffic, but your eyes must be on the lookout. If you're unsure about the position of an aircraft on frequency, ask them. And remember, airplanes without radios can be operating at non-towered airports. Many pilots carry handheld transceivers in these planes, but you can't be sure they'll hear you. Once turned onto final, pilots tend to concentrate on the runway and forget about all other outside visual references. That kind of tunnel vision is what causes collisions on approach. Check behind and below you at least once. And slow down. Collisions on approach typically involve a faster aircraft 
overtaking a slower one. After you land, there's no need to report clear of the runway unless your aircraft can't be seen from the approach end because of the runway configuration. A significant percentage of collisions occur during landing when aircraft are actually on or over the runway. These collisions typically have their genesis in the pattern. Given the small funnel of airspace planes occupy during landing, any confusion about who's landing, in what order, and where they are can have tragic consequences. If there is any consolation about collisions during landing, it's that there are often survivors. As with collisions during the approach phase, operations at non-towered airports present the greatest risk. Pilots flying instrument or straight-in approaches must be sure to look for conflicting aircraft in the pattern, and pattern flyers must look for aircraft on final before turning from base. Accident investigations of collisions during landing find that pilots often heard the aircraft they collided with on the frequency, but misunderstood their position. As in the approach phase, look below and behind you at least once before landing. Remember the rules for right of way, as defined by FAR Part 91.113 Sub G. When two or more aircraft are approaching an airport for the purposes of landing, the aircraft at the lower altitude has the right of way, but it shall not take advantage of this rule to cut in front of another which is on final approach to land or to overtake that aircraft. Collision avoidance needs to be a priority on the ground too. Runway incursions can lead to disastrous collisions. At non-towered airports, pilots need to be diligent in looking for traffic before taking the active for takeoff and in looking for aircraft waiting to depart when landing. Incursions can occur at towered airports as well. When talking to the tower before departure, announce your precise position. Always have an airport diagram in the cockpit, and if in doubt, be sure to request progressive taxi instructions. The airspace we fly in today is the product of tragic lessons learned from mid-air collisions. Indeed, all classes of airspace were created to keep aircraft separated even though more regulation isn't always the best answer to the problem. Remember, the collision over the Grand Canyon brought us the modern air traffic control system. A 1978 collision involving a Pacific Southwest Airlines 727 and a Cessna 172 over San Diego led to the creation of Class B airspace, then called the Terminal Control Area. This airspace created around major airports is off limits to student pilots flying solo and aircraft without transponders. The goal is to keep inexperienced flyers and targets that can't be seen easily on radar out of these high traffic areas. In 1986, an Aeromexico DC-9 descending toward Los Angeles and a single engine Piper collided over Cerritos, California. More than 80 people lost their lives. In the aftermath, Congress passed the Airport and Airway Safety Expansion Act, which established the Mode C Veil, requiring all aircraft within 30 miles of Class B airspace to have an operating altitude reporting transponder. It also requires all civil aviation air carrier aircraft to be equipped with TCAS, or Traffic Alert and Collision Avoidance Equipment. Thanks in part to this equipment, mid-air collisions involving air carrier aircraft have been nearly eliminated. Nowadays, we've got them on the TCAS is often heard on approach frequencies as commercial airlines spot targets on their TCAS systems even before the controllers can call the target. There are two versions of TCAS. TCAS-1 indicates the bearing and relative altitude of all aircraft within a selected range, generally 10 to 20 miles. With color-coded symbols, the display indicates which of the aircraft pose a potential threat. TCAS-2, in addition to a traffic display, traffic, traffic. also provides pilots with resolution advisories, or RAs, when needed. Monitor vertical speed. The system determines the course of each aircraft and whether it is climbing, descending, or flying straight and level. TCAS-2 then issues an RA, advising the pilots to execute the type of evasive maneuver necessary to avoid the other aircraft, such as climb or descend. Climb. Crossing, climb, climb, crossing, climb. Similar technology is already available for general aviation aircraft. The Ryan TCAT, or Traffic Collision Avoidance Device, works much the same way as TCAS systems, 
by picking up and processing transponder signals from nearby traffic and figuring which ones present a potential collision threat. Once the threat is identified, the TCAD displays the distance, bearing, and vertical separation above or below, and whether the target is climbing, descending, or in level flight. With technology costs falling, these and other electronic avoidance systems will find their way into the General Aviation Aircraft Panel. Meanwhile, the next generation of collision avoidance devices is currently under development, called Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, or ADSB. The system is designed to accommodate the free flight concept, enabling aircraft to fly directly to any point and avoid collisions without input from controllers and ground-based radar. But for GA pilots today, the challenge is to use the equipment we have now to avoid collisions. And our eyes and a proper scan technique are still the best tools we have. Make sure you're making the most of yours. That starts even before you get in the air. Know where you're going, your route, and the frequencies you'll need along the way. Fold maps and preset navigational aids to minimize distractions. This will minimize the time you have your head in a sectional or need to look at other flight planning materials and maximize the time your eyes will be outside the aircraft while flying. Make sure your windshield is clean. A squashed bug on the glass can block an aircraft from view and make it more difficult to focus properly. In a climb, keep the deck angle low to better visibility over the nose. Make S-turns until you can lower the angle for better forward visibility. Enlist passengers as part of your pre-flight briefing. Tell others in the plane to be on the lookout for other aircraft. Explain basic scanning procedure and explain the clock reporting system. You know how that's done. The nose is 12 o'clock, right wing tip is 3 o'clock, left wing tip is 9 o'clock. Remember that if you're getting advisories from ATC, traffic is called in relation to your flight path. That is, traffic is called in relation to where your plane is headed, not necessarily where it's pointed. In the air, Use your aircraft's maximum exterior lighting so that if you don't see the potential threat, maybe the threat will see you. Strobe lights can improve an aircraft's ability to be seen by as much as a factor of 10. Avoid using strobes on the ground when they can interfere with other pilots' vision. For example, don't have them on at night when holding short on the taxiway for landing traffic. Use your landing light on takeoff and in the pattern or on approach when landing during daylight to increase your visibility. Use good sunglasses. Glasses that block out UV rays will help protect your vision and reduce the fatigue your eyes feel. Neutral gray lenses are recommended. Be aware of and avoid areas of congestion. Even in our era of GPS point-to-point -point navigation, VORs remain popular navigation waypoints. Avoid overflying them, as well as approach fixes or holding points that may attract aircraft. Fly to the right of course and maintain special vigilance in the vicinity. Stay clear of military training areas, the fringes of controlled airspace, and other high traffic areas when possible. When crossing military training routes, fly across them at a perpendicular angle to minimize the time spent in the area. Be aware of the higher traffic concentration in and under Class B, C, and D airspace and within the Mode C veil. Class B charts depict high density arrival and departure routes and altitudes, and VFR pilots should plan to avoid them. Flyways and corridors are a feature of many Class B areas, but they tend to concentrate VFR aircraft that are not coordinating with ATC. Many pilots feel they're safer flying within Class B and C airspace than below it. Aircraft on flight following, or in the case of Class B, a clearance, have the safety advantage of radar control and advisory. But sometimes ATC is unable to provide this service, so pilots should always have another plan. Always use your transponder and squawk mode C, so controllers and aircraft equipped with TCAS can spot you. Observe proper procedures. Use correct cruising altitudes and traffic patterns. Announce your position early and often. And recognize that not everyone will be following the rules. Recognize the blind spots in your aircraft. High-wing aircraft have reduced visibility of aircraft above them and have their view of traffic blocked when making turns. Low-wing aircraft need to be careful for aircraft below them. 
communicate. Orange County Unicom, Bonanza 18470, 15 miles south, airport advisory. Report your position 15 miles out and listen to position reports from other inbound pilots. Sullivan County traffic, Saratoga is turning left base, runway 15, full stop, Sullivan County. At airports with radar approach control, contact the facilities at the distances prescribed on aeronautical charts. At non-towered airports, report your position. State your position when outbound from non-towered airports as well, and be aware that most outbound pilots don't give position reports after departure. If possible, be no more than 1,000 feet above pattern altitude within 10 miles of the airport. Turn on landing or recognition lights and descend to pattern altitude as soon as practical. If you operate an aircraft without radios or transponders, consider installing them. Remember, always scan for traffic. Use the techniques we've presented. Adapt them to your needs. Use your eyes and your head together. That's a responsibility that all pilots have to be vigilant in exercising. And if we do, it'll make the skies safer for everyone today and tomorrow.